Halfland, an ahistorical prehistory, part nine, the dwarf lord and the warden and his wife. In the 99th year of the common reckoning, after capturing and sacking Overwater, Orm marched his combined army of dwarves and halflings southward, with the intention of seeking out and destroying any remaining Skelding forces in the vicinity, so that the lands to the south of Overwater could be reclaimed for the halflings. He encountered Grimbold and his hastily gathered Skelding army at the Battle of Edwinham. The battle was inconclusive, but it was Grimbold who remained in possession of the battlefield, while Orm withdrew and marched back to Overwater. Orm was not happy. Although casualties among the dwarfs had been relatively light, his halfling allies had suffered grievous losses. As a result, their enthusiasm for reconquering land from the Skeldings had waned significantly. Many of the halflings also muttered that Orm had deliberately placed the halflings in the van, so that they would have to do the bulk of the fighting and win Orm glory without risking dwarvish lives. Orm was a realist. Grimbold had also suffered heavy losses in the battle, but those could be replaced. Orm could not summon more dwarves to his aid without leaving Dwarf Bridge vulnerable. It was clear that, without the support of the halflings, Orm would not even be able to hold on to Overwater. Any aspiration to win further territory from the Skeldings was pure fantasy. Orm's dwarves were still plundering the land around Overwater. He now ordered that as well as livestock and movable goods, those looting parties should also take Skelding prisoners. Orm then sent two of those prisoners south with a message for Grimbold, proposing that Orm and Grimbold meet under a flag of truce, and discuss the current situation. Grimbold had problems of his own. News of the sacking of Overwater had reached King Godric at Great Hall. Godric had an intense dislike of halflings, which inspired his consequent decision to personally lead the King's spearmen to the assistance of his subjects to the west of the Silver Stream. Many of Godric's captains had an intense dislike of Grimbold, which inspired them to point out that Grimbold had proved incapable of defending the territory entrusted to him, that no captain of the Skeldings would have failed so ignominiously, and that maybe Grimbold should be replaced as Warden of Overwater with someone who was actually capable of performing that role. Godric concurred with this counsel, and selected a captain named Aldric as Grimbold's replacement. It may be that in this choice he was influenced by his sister, Winfrith, who happened to be Aldric's wife. Grimbold still had some friends at court, and news of these decisions reached him just before Orm's letter. This may have influenced his decision to accept Orm's offer of a parley. Orm and Grimbold met at a location midway between Overwater and Edwinham. They got on remarkably well. Orm explained to Grimbold that dwarves were not simply big hairy halflings, and Grimbold expressed some regret at ever having treated them as such. Orm agreed that this was regrettable, as the dwarves had only ever wanted to trade with the Skeldings, and had only burned over water to the ground because in the past, dwarvish emissaries had been so cruelly treated. Even so, he had only taken the actions he did because the halflings had repeatedly urged him to. He said that he now realised that the halflings' calls for war were not driven by any historical injustice, but by the halflings' irrational loathing of the Skeldings. This had only become apparent to him when he had witnessed the wanton manner in which hate-crazed halflings had impaled themselves on Skelding spears at the Battle of Edwinham. Grimbold admired Orm's mail shirt, and asked 
whether the dwarves traded in such things, and whether they could be manufactured in larger sizes. Orm confirmed that indeed the dwarves did, and that they could. Grimbald then thanked Orm for explaining the background to the invasion. He could now see that it was the result of unfortunate misunderstandings on both sides. He would be happy to make peace on the basis of a return to the previous borders, and to allow dwarvish merchants to ply their wares in overwater. But, as before, no halfling would be permitted to cross the border waste and enter Skelding territory. Orm indicated a willingness to settle matters on this basis. Grimbold was delighted that he and Orm had reached this agreement. But there was one final thing. King Godric was marching toward Overwater, and he was in no mood to make peace with anyone. Grimbold did not have the king's ear, and in any case, Godric would not listen to reason. If Orm wanted peace with the Skeldings, Godric first had to be defeated. And so it was that Orm and Grimbold formed an alliance, and combined their forces against Godric. Grimbold returned to Edwinham, and gathered his leading men around him. These men owed their land and their position to Grimbold, and they, or their fathers, had sworn loyalty to him. Grimbold spoke. When Godric was crowned, he said, he confirmed me as Warden of Overwater. He also promised me that the foremost men among you would be made captains of the Skeldings, so that you would have a role in choosing future kings. Godric broke that second commitment, and he marches hence to unmake the first. He will put one of his lackey captains in my place as Warden of Overwater, and that placeman and his cronies will then help themselves to your riches and lands. I say that we have made this land what it is. It is ours to have and to hold, and no king or captain can rightly take it from us. But now we must fight to hold on to it. You may worry that we are weakened by our recent exertions, and that we are not in a position to defeat the army of Godric. But I have now made peace with Orm the Dwarf Lord, who will return the land he took from us. We demonstrated our strength to him at the Battle of Edwinham, and now we have nothing more to fear from him or the halflings. Instead, he will fight alongside us so that we can be free, and he can provide us with fine dwarvish armour and weaponry to help us defend the freedom we win. March with me. Let us defeat Godric and shake off the shackles of his rule. And, as the warden of a free overwater, I will make each of you a captain of overwater, and so we together, and our children after us, can continue to rule and enjoy what is ours. Most of those present greeted this speech with great enthusiasm. However, this enthusiasm was not shared by Grimbald's wife, Agnes. You say that our children will enjoy what is ours, she said to him afterwards, but our daughter Enflada is dead. What shall she enjoy? And rather than avenging her death, you are allying with those who are responsible for it. How can you do such a thing? I have three other daughters, replied Grimbald, but there can only be one warden of Overwater. His wife's response to this statement is not recorded in the histories that have come down to us, but there are indications that she did not find it altogether to her satisfaction. Meanwhile, Orm returned to Overwater. On arrival, he was informed that a halfling called Murdo Hamfist wished to speak with him. After he had bathed and dined, Orm summoned the halfling to him and asked him his business. 
Murdo Hamfist was not timid. He had fought with the spear halflings at the Battle of Edwinham and rallied the few survivors to him, forming a hedgehog of halfling spear points that had successfully kept the Skeldings at bay. His reputation among the halflings was therefore high, and so they had selected him to be their spokesman. He had been kept waiting for several hours and was not in a good mood. He spoke bluntly. My business is straightforward, he said. You have led us halflings here under false pretenses, telling us that you would win back our land. Instead, you have ravaged and plundered the land and only led us to the slaughter. Those of us that remain cannot hold here against the spears of the Skeldings. So where will we find the land that you promised us? Orm shrugged. There is plenty of land in the foothills of the northern mountains, he replied. Why don't you go and live there? Murdo shook his head. That will not do, he answered. We are not dwarves to eke out a living, tending sheep and scratching scanty crops from rugged hillsides. We are halflings, creatures of the plains, lovers of verdant pastures and fertile fields. Orm laughed. So, you are lovers of beef and cream and honey and crusty white bread, he said. So are we all given the chance. I see not why halflings should turn their fat, proud noses up at good land such as dwarves would fight over. I did not realise that dwarves could fight, Murdo retorted. In my experience, they trick halflings into doing their fighting for them. And now Orm shook his head. You halflings were not fighting for my benefit, he said, but for your own. However, he continued, if you want land that you do not have to fight for, there is much empty land to the east, beyond the dark hills. Flat, fertile land, fit to make the heart of a halfling sing. And how are we to get there? inquired Murdo. Head north and cross the Dwarf Bridge, replied Orm. Then take the road to Riverton and onward over Bensby Bridge. From Bensby, your path runs across the Geitzmark to the Hillhold, where my dead brother's father-in-law, Body, rules on behalf of the child Botolf. From there, it is but a short step over the dark hills and down into the empty plains beyond. I will write to my cousin Queen Ranvig, asking her to allow you and your folk free passage through the Geitzmark, and I will write to Body, asking him to allow you free passage through the Dark Hills. And so it was agreed. Orm wrote and dispatched the letters he had described, and arranged to meet Murdo back at Dwarf Bridge in one month's time, when he expected to have received replies to his correspondence. Meanwhile, Murdo led the halflings in overwater back across the border waste and sent messengers throughout the halfling territories, inviting any others who wished to join him in his journey to the east to assemble at Riverton. And, having sent some final wagons of loot back to Dwarf Bridge, Orm and his fighting dwarves marched south. Orm and Grimbald combined their forces and met the army of Godric at the Battle of Rose Bay Rise. Orm and his dwarves covered themselves in glory on that day, but Godric won the fight. Grimbald and Orm, and what was left of their combined army, fell back toward Overwater. After a couple of days' pause, to rest his men and allow time for the lightly wounded to be patched up, Godric followed them. Several of Orm's dwarves expressed an opinion that they should head back to Dwarf Bridge and leave Grimbald and Godric to fight this out between themselves. After all, what did the dwarves care about the internal conflicts of the Skeldings? But Orm pointed out to them that without dwarvish support, it seemed likely that Grimbald would be quickly defeated and Godric would be an overwater, in a position to march on Dwarf Bridge. And there was every reason to think that he would do so immediately. After all, why would he not seek to win a complete victory 
and crush all his foes while he had the opportunity to do so. The dwarves had already suffered heavy losses, and the halflings had deserted them. If the dwarves chose to desert Grimbold, they would be standing alone, and it seemed unlikely that their weakened forces would be sufficient to hold Godric at bay. Dwarf Bridge would fall. However, all was not lost. Autumn was already coming in, and the days were rapidly shortening. The campaigning season was coming to an end. If Godric could be delayed, even by a week or two, that might postpone any march on Dwarfbridge until the spring. And that would allow time for the dwarves to recover their strength and seek allies from elsewhere. Grimbold was keen to fight. He had rebelled against his king and his life was therefore forfeit. If Overwater fell, he and his family would have to flee into exile or live as outlaws. And so it was that, at the village of Absley, Orm and Grimbold halted their retreat and made a final stand against the forces of Godric. But their defiance was fruitless. Both Grimbold and Orm were slain, and Godric won the victory. Orm's fears proved groundless. Although Godric marched into Overwater, he chose not to advance on Dwarfbridge that year. Instead, he spent the winter consolidating his position. Grimbold's fears proved prescient. Godric proclaimed that all those who had supported Grimbold were traitors, and had thereby forfeited their lives and their land. Aldric was installed as Warden of Overwater, and his first task was to impose this proclamation. Those who had supported Grimbold lost their position and their land, and those who were captured by Aldric also lost their lives. Grimbold's wife Agnes and their children had early tidings of Grimbold's defeat and demise, and they fled over water before Godric arrived. They sought refuge with Grimbold's younger brother, Ingulf, and, out of respect for his dead brother, Ingulf gave them sanctuary and kept their whereabouts secret. Ingolf held extensive lands to the west of Overwater. He had not marched with Grimbald against Godric. Indeed, he had counselled Grimbald against this course of action, reminding Grimbald that he had sworn an oath of loyalty to the king, and that both he and Godric were of the same kin. Ingolf therefore hoped to weather the storm. He advised Agnes to give herself up and rely on Godric's mercy. Now Agnes wavered, and might have been convinced by Ingolf, but Aldric was in no mood to be merciful. He wanted to secure his position, by rewarding his followers and eliminating anyone who might head a rebellion against his rule. He issued a proclamation, declaring that Agnes and her children were rebels and outlaws, and that they and any who sheltered them were thereby condemned to death. Aldric also chose to interpret the definition of traitor widely, claiming that not only those who had marched with Grimbold were traitors, but also any that had not actively opposed him. And using this justification, Aldric arrested and executed many landowners and parcelled out their land between his followers. Aldric did not know that Ingolf was sheltering Agnes, but he did know that Ingolf's lands were wide and fertile. And so it was that Aldric declared that Ingolf was a traitor, and that Ingolf's lands were forfeit, and that Ingolf would be brought to Overwater and tried for treason. Aldric dispatched a party of soldiers to enforce these declarations, but when they arrived at Ingolf's longhouse, Ingolf was not there. He had heard of their coming and had fled. With him went many of his people and Agnes and her children. These events were described in The Flight of Agnes, an epic poem written in a literative metre, some fragments of which have come down to us. While some of the episodes described are no doubt exaggerated or mythological, 
it does seem that Ingolf, Agnes, and their companions headed westward, deep into the foothills of the Twilight Mountains. The foothills of the Twilight Mountains were bleak and uninhabited. In late autumn, in the pouring rain, they must have been a miserable place. The party had nothing to eat and suffered accordingly. However, it seems that, at their last extremity, Ingolf was able to trap a rabbit, and Agnes went alone to fetch water, so that she could make a nourishing broth to feed to her starving children. According to the poem, while thus occupied, Agnes was attacked by a bear, which she strangled with her bare hands. Now, this does seem somewhat far-fetched. As a noblewoman, it is most unlikely that Agnes would know how to make broth. Further, even a fishwife might be overmatched if asked to wrestle a bear. And Agnes is described as a gentle lady, mild-mannered and unused to physical exertion. The next extant fragment of the poem describes how Agnes, now wrapped in a bearskin, found a pass leading northward through the mountains while searching for a certain herb with which to make a poultice to treat her son Gaia, who had contracted a case of scabies. She then led the band of fugitives through this pass into the lands beyond. The final fragment of the poem has Agnes and her companions descending from the mountains into the plains below, which are burgeoning with the exuberant life of a new spring. Here they decide to settle, and Ingolf and Gaia build a great hall, which becomes the centre of the community. However much weight is put on the veracity of this poem, it does seem indisputable that the small, scalding settlement of Bear's End was established to the north of the Twilight Mountains at this time. The first records we have date from a few years after the events described in the Flight of Agnes, but do state that the Lord of Bear's End was, at that time, Gaia, the son of Agnes Bearslayer.